اعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء وخاتم المرسلين والشفيع المظنبين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد ولا أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطحرهم تطحيرا واللانة الدائمة الباقية لعادائهم ومنكر فضائلهم وغاصب حقوقهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم إن الله اصطفى عدم ونوحا وعلى إبراهيم وعلى عمران على العالمين صلوات من إبراهيم With the blessings of the Azhar of Sayyid al-Shahda. We have been looking at different dimensions of the issue of family life in Islam from the perspective of the Qur'an and the seerah of the Ma'asumin. For us, Qur'an is the constitution and the Ahlul Bayt are basically the embodiment of the values and teachings of the Qur'an. The theme on which I have been talking in these nights is on the issue of family life in Islam. And I have tried to connect this theme with the fundamental concept that we have in Shia Madhab. That our deen started, the first call was made to the family of the Prophet, Da'awat Azul Ashira. The first person to accept that call was the wife of the Prophet. And we see this process of the importance given to the family of the Prophet, you know, as a way of looking at the importance of the family life for our, ourselves. Ayat Tathir was there, the event of Mubahila is there. But tonight I would like to go to another important event and to connect that with the impact of the upbringing of Abu Talib and Fatima bint Asad. Because last night we talked about the example of Asma bint Umais and the challenges that she faced in her life. There were two important lessons that we learned from her Sira. One was of maintaining the, the faith, the Iman, even in difficult and challenging situations. And number two was inculcating the true Islamic values, the villa of Ahlul Bayt, among the children in such a way that it continues in the generation to come. And we see that process right from the day one, when you look at this seerah of Abu Talib and Fatima bint Asad. You know, if you look at the early days of Mecca, when Quraysh decided to you know, oppose the Prophet of Islam, they used different methods. Initially, they ignored him. But when they realized ignoring him is not going to, you know, uh, eliminate the, the mission, they started to actively oppose him. The first was the issue of labeling him as, Nauzubillah, as a lunatic, majnoon. When that label didn't work, Looking at the ayat of Quran that he was presenting, they said, well, let's say he's a shair. This is nothing to do with revelation. These are his own poetry. The Arabs of the Jahiliyyah, at least they were very well versed with poetry. They knew this is not poetry. You know, that was their, their expertise during those days. And so even the label of shair didn't work. And so then they looked at the impact of the uh, prophet's words on the minds of the people. And they said, well, he's a sahir. Don't even go close to him. He's a sorcerer. If you say, if, if you listen to him, you will be mesmerized. When those labels didn't work, they basically 
you know, went to the second strategy of trying to bribe him. And they came to Abu Talib and they said, you know, ask your nephew, whatever he wants. He wants to become our leader, we'll make him the king of Makkah. He wants the best of women, we'll provide whomever he wants. He wants gold and silver, we'll give that to him. And that is where the, you have the response of the Prophet where he says to his uncle, even if they bring the sun on my hand, one hand, and put the moon on the other, I'm not going to abandon my mission. So bribery didn't work. Propaganda didn't work. Bri bribery didn't work. Then the third strategy was basically to, you know, violently oppose him. But the problem was they couldn't touch him because of Abu Talib. So they went to him, they said, you disassociate yourself from him. And then we'll deal with him. And if you don't do this, we are going to put your entire family under sanctions. Social, economic boycott. So all these things that we hear these days happening to Muslim countries or nations, this is nothing new. It's already been tried in Makkah. And that's where you see not others suffered at that time. It was Abu Talib who said, if you want to do this, you go ahead and do this. They made a pact among themselves. And to such an extent that even social interaction with them was forbidden. Even to buy or sell anything to them was forbidden. Their lives became, you know, such a situation that it became dangerous for them. Abu Talib took the entire you know, extended family to the place which he owned outside, just outside Mecca, known as Sha'bi Abi Talib. And they spent three years there. And that is where you see the entire family is there, supporting the cause of Islam, and going through the suffering and difficulties of the socio-economic boycott of the time. And so what you see later on, you know, in Karbala, for example, we look at the, the closeness of the family of Imam Hussain He could have done this alone, no doubt about it. But then he would be only a shaheed. He wouldn't be Sayyid al-Shahada. And the beauty of this sacrifice in Karbala is that Hussein was not alone. His family members supported him. And that added to the glory and the status of the Shahadat of Karbala. But you will see even, even there, you know, something which we do not appreciate. And I think we, we do not credit this to Abu Talib and Fatima bint Asad. I believe it's not only, you know, the essence of goodness in the Shahada of Karbala and in this family. I think it's also an impact of the Iman and the commitment of Abu Talib and his wife Fatima bint Asad. We normally divide the Shahada of Karbala into two groups. We say, you know, Ashab of Hussein and the Shahada of Banu Hashim. Eighteen individuals, male, who were killed. If you look at the list of those who are known as Shahada of Banu Hashim, they were actually not Banu Hashim. All of them were Ali Abi Talib. Each single one from the Shahada of Banu Hashim are the descendants of Abu Talib and Fatima bint Asad. It is their contribution, it is their impact, whether you say their upbringing or genetic, you know, um, feeling going on of the sacrifice for the sake of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when we talk about the importance of family, you, you have to realize it's not in the issue just, you know, relevant to ourselves as families. This is also what our religion and our mazhab stands for. It is given great importance in our history and in our religious teaching. Salawat Quran Akbar. The example of Asma bint Umayyis that I mentioned. She has a son from Abu Bakr. But she raises him in such a way that he becomes one of the foremost Shias of the early days. And this is where I would like to bring this point. I missed in using this term last night. We hear about this problem of 
you know, generation gap. In a Shi'i family, we cannot have generation gap. When it comes to our values and our teachings of Islam and Tashayyu, there can be no great gap between one generation and another. As parents, we have to do the tarbiyat and upbringing in such a way Maybe the style would change depending on the environment and the time. But the core values of the mazhab of Ahlul Bayt will continue. And that is the biggest challenge we have as Shia immigrants in this part of the world. Salawat <laughs> Among the shuhada of Ali Abi Talib in Karbala, the name of Abbas is there at the top. And when we uh, look at his example, and I again, would, since we are going to dedicate this majlis to Hazrat Abbas, let me talk about this importance of this impact of parents' tarbiyat on their children, where there is no gap as far as transfer of values are concerned from one generation to another. We know Hazrat Abbas in the context of Karbala. But sometimes we need to look at his life in a more broader pers perspective. Let us even start with the issue of the marriage of Amir al-Mu'mineen to janab Umm al Because her marriage to Amir al-Mu'mineen was of very unique in a sense as far as the purpose and the reason for the marriage is concerned. When we... Um, Look at the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen. You know, he had five wives and about 26 children. As long as Fatima salawatullah alayha was alive, <laughs> of course, he didn't marry anyone. She was alone. Very, very much like the situation of Rasulullah and Bibi Khadija. All other wives came later on. And so the other four wives, including Asma bin Umayz that I mentioned last night, they were married to Amir al-Mu'mineen after the wafat of Bibi. And when we look at the marriage of Amir al-Mu'mineen to Umm al it's unique in a sense the purpose. That this marriage was conducted with a specific purpose in mind. The narrators tell us that one day Amir al-Mu'mineen goes to his older brother Aqil. And he asked him that I would like to get married to somebody who can give me courageous sons who would help my son Hussein in time of need. And so the purpose was already there. The purpose was there. The person was found later on. And that is where Imam Hussain goes to Aqil. And this is a point of reflection for us. The question is, why did Ali have to go to his brother Aqil? Didn't he have ilm al ghaib And this is where we have to understand the, the role of ilm al ghaib in the lives of the prophets, anbiya, and a'imma. Yes, it is a privilege given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to them. That special knowledge is actually the basis of their power of miracles, even their infallibility. Everything depends on that special ilm al ladunni that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, gives to them. But remember it comes with this purpose that you will use this ilm al ghaib the knowledge of the unseen, only for the purpose of guiding others or for the purpose of proving your own claim that you are the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though they know the realities, they know the ghaib, but they would not use it for themselves. Otherwise, the whole system of chain and effect in the system of universe will collapse because they do not intervene in that way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. He knows where shay shay shaitan is going to intervene and create problems, but Allah doesn't do anything. It doesn't mean he doesn't know because he has created the, the human beings with the purpose of imtihan, test and trial. So he lets things happen even though he knows. Because ultimately there is a day of judgment and there are consequences after that.
So our Aimma Hevil Mirai, Imam Hussain alayhi salam knew what is going to happen in Karbala. He had the power. You know, when we talk about the Ilm al Ghaib, which comes with that power of Mu'jiza, but the test becomes even more difficult for them when they have the power, still they do not use it. Remember last night's example. Just put yourself in place of Imam Hussain alayhi salam that when his young son comes with success in this one-to-one -one combat with the famous warrior of the enemy, asking only for a drop of water, was that not in the capacity of Hussein to give him that? He could have done that. But he's all, the entire purpose of his test and trial in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to see that we have given you the power, but don't use it for yourself. And that is where you understand the greatness of Hussein bin Ali. You know, the sadness and the grief that he goes through at that moment. Let me, you know, mention something because I talked about it in Urdu, but I think it's a message every young person should learn of having this respect for the feelings of the parents. The last statement of Ali Akbar, what was it? He already has been wounded by the spear. The spearhead is in there. He's falling down from the horse. Even to breathe at that time is very difficult. But he uses whatever energy he had to send a message loud to his father. What was the message? He didn't ask him for help. He just, you know, conveyed his last greetings and salam to him. He didn't want to bother his old father to come and help him. But then the statement after that, he says, oh my father, your grandfather has already come with a bowl of water because Imam, when he sent him back, he said, oh my son, go. Your jad is waiting with a bowl of water for you, you will never be thirsty again. Ali Akbar could not forget the sadness on the face of his father at that moment. Even when he's falling down from the horse, he remembers that. He wanted to console his father where he says that your grandfather has already come. He has already quenched my thirst. I am no more thirsty. In a way, he's saying to his father, don't grieve and be sad because you couldn't give me water. That is the example of what we call the khulq of Nabawi, reflected in the words and the actions of Ali Akbar. And so these, these are the things that we have to learn from the you know, family relationship of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu wa salam. Salawat So yes, Ali had ilm al-ghayb. But still he goes to his brother and asked him. In a way he wanted to give us a lesson. That in issues where you yourself don't know, you go and ask those who are expert. Consult those who know. And this, this is where we see because Aqil was known among the uh, circles of Banu Hashim and Quraysh as Nassaba. Nassaba means somebody who is very well, you know, familiar with the tribes, various tribes and their characteristics and their, you know, strength and weaknesses. And since he knew the background, Ali goes to him and he says, you know, I would like to marry somebody from a very courageous family so that I can have sons who would help my son Hussein at the time of need. And this is where, you know, uh, we see the example of referring to those who are expert in their own fields. And Amir al-Mu'mineen, you know, when he talked to Aqil, Aqil mentioned to him, he says, you know, you don't have to go that far. Aqi, ayna anta an Fatima bint Hizam al-Kalabiyya? 
فإنه ليس في العرب أشجع من آبائها Aqil says, oh my brother, do not you know about Fatima bint Hizam al kalabiya You know, there is nobody among the Arabs whose forefathers are more courageous than hers. So Aqil not only knows about the background of the families and tribes, he also knows individuals who is married, who is not married. And I think this should be a message for our elders in the community. We have moved from the old society, from the eastern ways of doing things, and in that process we have lost some of the good things which happened in the east. We hear this complaint of, you know, parents saying, how do we get our children married? There is no process. But there was an old and a very well successful method used for generations. Where are the elders of the community? They could be no better cause in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than this. Get involved. The community looks for a shortcut. You know, let's have mixed gatherings and our children will marry, you know, within the community. It doesn't happen. I know people don't like it when I say that, but it doesn't happen that way. The most you will get is relationship established on physical beauty, not on the basis of the character of individuals. But if you have elders of the community get involved in this, you know, you can even do this on a professional manner. Have a very discreet professional marriage bureau with Islamic values, where some seniors and elders get involved in order to bring you know, families who have similar values and backgrounds together. And this is doable, but we do not want to go in that way. We look for shortcuts, and then we are going to face, you know, problems that only Allah knows. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what will be the extent of that for the next generation. And so this is where we see the example of Aqil, that he even knows the individuals. He didn't say, okay, let me go and think about it and, you know, ask people. No. He immediately says, Akhi, ain't anta? You know, what about Fatima bin Tehizam al kalabiya There is no one more courageous among the Arabs than her forefathers. Ali ag agreed. And he sends his brother Aqil with a proposal. Aqil goes to Hizam from that tribe of al kalabiya you know, puts the proposal of Ali to them. You know, the father, according to the narration, when he heard it, hasha wa bashra. You know, he became very happy, of course, who wouldn't be happy if the proposal is of Amir al muminin He says, let me consult my family. And this is where, again, consultation within the family is one element of the seerah comes in. Although he was the wali of the, of the girl, Still he goes, you know, and he comes back with a smile on his face that the family has agreed on this proposal. And this is where this marriage takes place on the same mahar which was there for baby Fatima to Zahra salawatullah alayha. <coughs> we don't have the exact date or the year of the marriage, but we wouldn't be that far-fetched to say that since Abbas was born on, in the year 26 of Hijrah, the marriage took place a year before that. There were two important things that we see in the character of Umm al -Banin. Number one, her loyalty to Ali Muhammad. Her name, her proper name is Fatima, Fatima bint Hizam al kalabiya and she comes as the wife of Ali, who had a wife by the name of Fatima, but she was Fatima bint Rasulullah. And Ali has children from that Fatima bint Rasulullah. And she knows the respect of you know, the owner and the status of Bibi Fatima to Zahra. And so the very first thing she does, she says to Amir al muminin that out of respect for Bibi Fatima, don't call me by my name. 
Rather, call me by my kunya, or in Urdu we say kunniyat, which is Ummul Banin, which was actually a kunniyat. This is her kunniyat even before her marriage. This was the kunniyat of her grandmother. And literally it means Ummul Banin, the mother of sons. Probably it was out of this vela and love for Fatima to Zahra that when she says to Ali that call me by my kunya, Ummul Banin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded her by giving her four sons. And to make this a reality that she is not only Ummul Banin in her kunniyat, she really is the mother of sons. Salawat from She is also known, the historians who have written about her, that her devotion and wafa and loyalty to Ali Muhammad was very pronounced and clear in her character in dealing with the family. And that is in a way inherited by Abbas bin Ali and the other ch children who came from Umm al -Banin. When we talk about this issue of the character from the children, you know, and this issue that what was the purpose of this marriage of Amir al-Mu'minin to Umm al-Banin, this was not a, you know, unknown reality. Even Zuhair bin Qain, on the eve of Ashura, out of his sincere, you know, advice to Abbas, he sits down with Abbas and he says, Oh, Abbas, your father asked his brother Aqil for a marriage with a woman who comes from a courageous family so that the sons who will come from that marriage will help Hussein. And then Zuhair basically, you know, wants, wanted to boost the morale of Abbas by saying that your father preserved you for such a day. You have come to this dunya for Hussein. And so do not, you know, uh, in any way lapse in that expectation. Where Abbas becomes angry in a way that also, hey, tomorrow you will see. Don't, ins you know, incite me. Tomorrow you will see what you had never seen before. And so we, we see that th this was a reality when it comes to the purpose of the marriage, and this has really a great impact in the great, greatness of Abbas bin Ali. Somebody who knew from his childhood that why I came to this dunya. With that purpose, when he is restrained by the Imam of the time, just as a masoom Imam has ilm al ghaib but doesn't use it has the ability to do miracles but doesn't do it for his own sake. Because he's going through imtahan ibtala, you know, this is the level of the imtahan for Abbas bin Ali. Knowing all these things, this is what he is thinking about. Today is the day for me. But when the masoom imam says no, he doesn't argue, he doesn't hesitate. He is a Muslim in a total sense of the word of submission. Salawat al On a symbolic level, Abbas and Hussein were so close that on a symbolic level, we, we can use this ayat from Surah Al-Shams, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالشَّمْسِ وَزُحَاءَ وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا Where Allah says, I swear by the sun and the moon which follows it. The sun and its light and the moon which follows it. Hussein is the Shams and Abbas is the Qamar. Shams is the source of light. The Qamar gets the light from the Shams. 
And in that sense, when you look at the events of Karbala, the famous title of Abbas is Qamar Bani Hashim. He indeed is the Qamar of Banu Hashim, but gets his source of Noor from Hussein bin Ali, alayhi salatu wasalam. And so it was not only the impact of the upbringing of Umm al banin that we see in the loyalty and wafa of Abbas. Even Imam Hussain alayhi salam, the way he treated the children of Fatima bint Rasulullah and his own other children is something worth noticing in his life. Because we had to realize, yes, 26 children were all children of Ali, but only four of them were, were from Fatima to Zahra. Their status is not like the other children. They were the children of Rasulullah. They are Ali Rasul, as we call them. And he wanted to make sure his other children understand that clearly. Let me take you to an example. This is whether it's in Jamal or Safin, I'm not sure about it. But one of the two battles. Where Imam asked his son Muhammad Hanafiya. He asked him that, oh my son, I want you to go and confront the enemy. And he says to him, you know, go and attack now the Qalb, the central flank of the enemy. Muhammad Hanafiya goes, does his, you know, battle, comes back very tired. Amir al-Mu'minin, you know, shrinks water on him because he was tired and feeling very hot. After Muhammad Hanafiya rested, then Ali says, stand up, my son. Now go and attack the right flank of the enemy. Muhammad Hanafiya goes again, does his job, comes back. Again, Ali gives him water, he sits down, rests. And then Ali says, oh, my son, stand up now. Go and attack the left flank. Muhammad Hanafiya goes, after all, he also has the shajat of Ali. Came back the third time. Now this is a conversation between the son and the father. We don't have any right to make a comment here. A very natural, you know, conversation goes on. Muhammad Hanafiya says, he says, oh my father, you're send, sending me three times in the mouth of death. What about my older brothers, Hassan and Hussein? They are sitting here on the side. Now it was a family issue. Amir al-Mu'mani looked at his son and he says something very beautiful. He says, oh my son, you are my son. And they are abna Rasulullah. They are the children of Rasulullah. Do not you want me to preserve them? Because Ali was not allowing Hassan and Hussein to go to the battle. And this is, this is we, we see very clear message being given by Ali to his other children. That when it comes to Hassan and Hussein and Zainab and Kulsum, their status is different. Yes, you are my children. But they are the children of Fatima to Zahra. They are related to Rasulullah. They have an honor and a respect which no one else has, even my other children. Once somebody taunted Muhammad Hanafiya about it. And he gave a very good response. He says, you do not realize that I am the hands of my father and Hassan and Hussein are the eyes of my father. Do not you know that whenever an attack happens on the face or the eyes, it is the hands which come to protect it? So I was there protecting them because they are the apple of my father's eyes. And, and this, this is where we see this seerat, and definitely Abbas bin Ali looked at it. And he got this message very clearly from his mother as well as his father. That when it comes to Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, they are Abna Rasulullah. And as far as Hussein is concerned in the events of Karbala, you know, you have come to this dunya for the sake of protecting Hussein bin Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. Salawat from the And therefore, this issue of generation gap doesn't exist in the Shi'i concept. 
It shouldn't be there. If it is there, there is a problem. We have to strengthen our villa and our devotion of, to our mazhab and make sure that doesn't happen. Especially when we talk about the tarbiyah from the father and the mother. You know, one of the Arab uh, poets has put this very beautifully. Because there are many things, many, many values that we imbibe through the upbringing and tarbiyat of the parents. Where this Arab poet actually prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where he says, La abdaballahu ummi innaha sharibat, hubba al wasi wa ghaddanihi ma'al laban. That, O oh Allah, do not, permish, do not punish my mother. Because she imbibed the love of Ali and nurtured that to me in her milk. Even the nurturing of the mother, you know, can become a way of transferring the villa of Ali and Ali Ali among the children. وَكَانَ لِي وَالِدٌ يَحْوِي أَبَا حَسَنٌ And I had a father who used to love Abu Hassan. فَصِرْتُ مِنْ زِي وَزَا أَحْوَى عَبَلْ حَسَنْ And it, be, it is because of the mother and that father that I also have the villa and the love of Ali. Salawat pranik wa These words of this Arab poet is normally for us. But its perfect application is in form of Umm al -Baneen. The way she raised her own children. And this is where I would like to come to something which we rarely discuss. That this wafa and love and the villa that Abbas had because of this upbringing by the mother. This continued in the generations of Abbas. Abbas had been blessed with six children, four sons and two daughters. But his descendants you know, continued through the first one, Ubaidullah, who lived till, till about year 155 of the Hijra. And he was highly respected by our fourth Imam as a scholar in his own right, and a ravi of hadith and a very virtuous and pious person. And through, our, you know, Ubaidullah bin Abbas line, there were many other sons he had, uh, Hassan, and then Hassan, we go to Hamza and others, but let me just mention one. Hamza bin Qasim bin Ali bin Hamza bin Hassan bin Ubaidullah bin Abbas bin Ali. This is the sixth generation after Abbas. And this descendant of Abbas, he actually lived during the Ghaybat Sughra era. We're talk talking about the days of the 11th Imam. And he's considered among the authentic narrators of hadith. He is one of the uh, sheikhs of nar nar narrations of Sheikh Saduq. He was contemporary of Sheikh Kulaini when he comp comp compiled Usul Kafi. But the interesting point that I saw in his biography is basically that after the wafat of the 11th Imam, in Ghaybat al-Sughra is now starting, the Abbasid establishment wanted to find out who is the surviving child of the 11th Imam because then they had this prediction that he will be the Mahdi and they wanted to eliminate him and during those days the wives of the 11th Imam including the mother of our present Imam sought refuge in the house of this Hamza a descendant of Abbas bin Ali this villa and loyalty and dedication to Ali Muhammad continued through the generations till we see in form of the protection for Bibi Narjis, the mother of Imam Zaman Jalallahu Ta'ala Farjah Sharif. And so let us, let us you know, appreciate this whole phenomenon that we have when we talk about family life. The impact of the upbringing of the mother and the father, especially when it comes to maintaining the iman and the deen and the mazhab that we have. This is the legacy that we have from the shahada of Karbala. 
when we talk about, you know, Hazrat Abbas, I've been asked to even briefly, you know, talk about the importance of his alam. Alam, in Arabic, it means a flag. And this is a symbolic flag. It's not exactly the way it was. Nobody knows exactly what was the form or the shape of the alam those days. But wherever the Shias have been, according to their own tradition and custom, you know, they have built alams. Especially during the time of the Azav Sayyid al-Shuhada, Abbas, the alam associated with Abbas symbolizes, you know, his loyalty, his brotherhood, and the sense of total submission to the will of Allah, Rasul, and the Imam of the time. And it also specially symbolizes the Muslimiyyad of the children of Hussein, especially when you see the alam with the water bag and the mashk in a symbolic way related to Sakina. And so these, these are the symbolic, you know, uh, manifestation of what happened in, in Karbala. That's not Hazrat Abbas, it is alam of Hazrat Abbas. And it has a symbolic value for us and therefore we respect and honor it in that way. But whenever we look at it, we have to remember that closeness of the family. We have to remember the demands that brothers can have from one another. Because that is the part of the seerat that we get from Abbas bin Ali alayhi salatu wa salam. Salawat wa salam. One of the Urdu poets has put this perspective in a very, very beautiful way where he says, Jin haaton se bhai ko sahara na mile, un haaton se abbas ka matam na karo. You know, look at the impact of that alam. When you kiss that alam, when you do matam for Abbas, remember it's not just remembering him in that way. In trying to imbibe those values for which he gave up everything. His l devotion to Imam of the time, his devotion to the family of the Imam, to his brothers, and to his family at large. Salawat جناب عباس کے عظمت کے لیے ہمارے چھٹے امام کے جو الفاظ ہیں زیارت میں وہ کافی ہیں جہاں چھٹے امام نے کہا ہے کہ جب زیارت کو رہا عباس کی اشحد لکا بالتسلیم والتصدیق والوفا والنصیحہ لخلف النبی صلی اللہ علیہ وآلہ کہ ہم سلام کرتے ہیں آپ پر تسلیم کے خاطر جہاں جہاں حسین نے روکا آپ خاموش رہے والتصدیق امام وقت کے موقف پر پورا یقین تھا جو کچھ حسین کہیں گے یا کریں گے وہ برحق ہے والوفا ٹوٹل لویلٹی کا اظہار ہوا ہے والنصیحہ النصیحہ یہ اردو والی نصیحت کی بات نہیں ہے اور عربی میں نصیحت سے مراد یہاں سنسیاریٹی ہے ٹوٹل اخلاص جو کچھ کیا ہے اللہ کے مرضی کے خاطر کیا ہے اور ایک اور فقرہ ملتا ہے السلام علیکہ ایوہ العبد الصالح سلام ہو اس پر عباس کی بات ہو رہی ہے العبد الصالح جو خدا کا نیک بندہ ہے عبد الصالح کی تفسیر کیا ہے المطیع لله ولرسوله ولأمير المؤمنين والحسن والحسين صلى الله عليه وسلم العبد الصالح وہ بندہ ہے خدا کا نیک بندہ وہ ہے کہ جو اللہ رسول اور امیر المؤمنین اور حسن حسین کا مطیع ہو جہاں تک جناب عباس کے جذبہ اطاعت کی بات ہے جناب عباس نے اپنے مقصد وجود کو ذہن میں رکھتے ہوئے آپ سوچ لیں ان کے ان کے تمنائیں کیا اور رہی ہوں گی 
एस्पिरेशंस जिसे हम लोग कहते हैं कि बाबा ने शादी की थी ताकि हम दुनिया में आए और हुसैन के लिए हुसैन की नुसरत कर सकें फन ने हर में अब्बास ने उनको ट्रेन किया है और शुजात और बहादुरी के उस लेवल पर थे कि अब्बास को मालूम था कि अगर हम आगे बढ़ेंगे तो हुसैन की नुसरत ज़रूर कर सकते हैं लेकिन हर मरहले पे खैमों के हटाने की बात होती है जहाँ जहाँ हुसैन ने रोका कहीं रवायत नहीं मिलती है कि अब्बास ने एक लम्हे के लिए भी हेजिटेट किया इसलिए कि हुसैन जानते थे कि मेरा पूरा वजूद वक्फ है हुसैन के लिए मेरी कोई मर्जी नहीं है मेरी कोई ख्वाहिश नहीं है मेरी कोई तमन्ना नहीं है जो कुछ है हुसैन के खातिर है शब आशूर आप देख लें शमर मलून जब आया है कोफे से इबन जियात के हुक्म से उस वक्त आता है जब बात हुई पहले जंग के लिए फिर जंग रोकी गई रात की मोहलत मिलती है मामला ज़रा ठंडे जब हो गए हैं उस वक्त शमर जो है ख़याम हुसैनी के करीब आता है और आवाज़ देता है ऐ ना बन उख्तना चूँकि शमर भी उसी कबीले का था जिससे जनाब उमुलबनीन थी तो कबीले के उस रिश्ते की बुनियाद पर कहता है कि हमारे बहन के बेटे कहाँ हैं अब्बास ने कोई जवाब नहीं दिया दोबारा उसने दोहराया इमाम हुसैन आसलम कहते हैं जाके सुन तो लो क्या कहता है वो जनाब अब्बास अपने तीनों भाइयों के साथ जाते हैं और वहाँ पर शमर मलून कहता है कि हम इबन जियाद से अमान नामा लिखवा के ले आए हैं आपके लिए तुम हुसैन को छोड़ दो अपनी जान को बचा लो इस कराबतदारी के हवाले से हमने ये लिखवाया है अब्बास के जवाब को आप देखें लानक अल्लाह व लान अमानक खुदा तुझ पर भी लानत करे तेरे अमान नामे पर भी लानत करे तुझे अपनी कराबतदार का ख्याल रहा कराबतदारी का ख्याल रहा लेकिन तुम्हें उस कराबतदारी का ख्याल नहीं है जो रसोल्ला की है रसूल के नवासे के लिए अमान नामा नहीं है और मेरे लिए है तुझ पर भी लानत हो तेरे अमान नामे पर भी लानत हो शब आशूर में जब वफादारी का ऐलान हुआ है खैमे में सबसे पहले बनो हाशिम में से जनाब अब्बास उठे हैं कि मौला आप कह रहे हैं हम लोग छोड़ के चले जाएं आपके बाद जिंदा रह के हम क्या करेंगे हमारे लिए वजूद का मकसद यही है कि आपकी खिदमत करें आपकी नुसरत करें आपकी हिफाजत करें और आशूर के दिन जो भरोसा था इमाम हुसैन आसलम को जनाब अब्बास पर कि जब अपने लश्कर को तीन हिस्से में तकसीम किया है मैसरा और मैमना उसके सरदारी जहैर और अब्बास को दी जनाब हबीब को दी कल्ब लश्कर की सरदारी और अलमदारी अब्बास को दी असहाब अपनी शहादत पेश कर चुके हैं बनो हाशम की नौबत आती है वो मरहला भी होता है आता है कि बनो हाशम के अफराद भी यके बाद दीगरे शहीद हो चुके हैं अब्बास आते हैं भाई के सामने और यही कहते हैं कि मौला मेरे सीने में तंगी का एहसास हो रहा है मुझे इजाज़त दें कि इन मुनाफिकीन से जा के हम कताल करें और जंग लड़ें इमाम हुसैन आसलम अपने भाई को देखते हैं इजाज़त अब नहीं दी लेकिन एक जुमला कहा कि इज़ा मज़ई था तफर्र का अस्करी अब्बास अगर तुम चले जाओगे तो मेरा लश्कर ख़त्म हो जाएगा अब्बास ने यही कहा था ना कि मवला अब वो लश्कर कहाँ रहा कि जिसके हम अलमदार हों इमाम यही कहना चाहते थे कि अब्बास तुम्हें अंदाज़ा नहीं है कि जब तक तुम जिंदा हो मेरे लिए मेरा पूरा लश्कर जिंदा है इतना भरोसा था 
امام نے اجازت نہیں دی لیکن عباس کی مدد کے لیے بچوں کی آواز بلند ہوئی الاتش الاتش بس بچوں کی الاتش کی آواز جب آئی ہے امام حسین علیہ السلام کہتے ہیں عباس اگر کچھ کرنا چاہتے ہو تو ان بچوں کے پانی کے سبیل کا کوئی انتظام کرو بس حکم ملا اور جناب عباس تیار ہو گئے سکینہ سے کہتے ہیں اپنا مشکیزہ دو وہ چار سال کی بچی جو اتنا محبت کرتی تھی چچا سے مشکیزہ اس نے جب دیا ہوگا کتنی امیدوں کے ساتھ چچا کو مشکیزہ دیا ہوگا آگے بڑھنا چاہتے ہیں لیکن ایک مرتبہ فضا کی آواز آتی ہے کہ عباس تم جا رہے ہو زینب نے تمہیں بلایا ہے اپنے خیمے میں عباس جاتے ہیں جناب زینب کے خیمے میں وہاں بھی اس بھروسے کا اندازہ آپ کو ہوگا کہ اہل حرم کے دلوں میں کتنا بھروسہ تھا عباس پر عباس خیمے میں آئے زینب نے عباس سے کہا ہم تمہیں روک نہیں رہے ہیں لیکن بیٹھو پھر ایک جملہ کہتی ہیں کہتی ہیں عباس بابا نے ہم سے کئی بار کہا تھا کہ بیٹی ایک وقت آئے گا تمہیں قیدی اور اسیر بنایا جائے گا تیری چادر کو لوٹا جائے گا بازوں کو رسن رسن میں بازوں میں رسن باندھے جائے گی اور جب ہم یہ سنے سنتے تھے مجھے یقین تھا کہ یہ برحق کہہ رہے ہیں بابا لیکن ایک وقت آیا کہ تم پیدا ہوئے تم جوان ہوئے تمہاری بہادری اور شجاعت کا شہر عالم عرب میں جب پھیلا ہے کبھی کبھی میں سوچتی تھی وہ بہن جس کا باز جیسا بھائی ہو اس کی چادر کو کون لوٹے گا اس کے بازو پر کون رسن باندھے گا لیکن اب باس آج جو بھی جا رہا ہے زندہ واپس نہیں لوٹ رہا ہے مجھے آج یقین ہے تمہارے جانے کے بعد بابا نے جو کچھ کہا ہے وہ ہو کے رہے گا عزت وران حسین عباس وہاں سے روانہ ہوئے جناب عباس کے شجاعت کا یہ اثر تھا کہ لشکر یزیدی نے مقابلہ نہ کیا عباس نہر القما پر قابض ہو جاتے ہیں مشکیزے کو پانی سے بھرا پھر اپنے ہاتھوں میں پانی کو لیا لگتا یہی ہے کہ جب پانی ہاتھوں میں آیا ہے عجب نہیں کہ سکینہ کی پیاس یاد آ گئی پانی کو پھینک دیتے ہیں کہ وفا شعاری کا یہ جواز نہیں ہو سکتا ہے کہ سکینہ اور حسین پیاسے رہے اور عباس کے لبوں میں پانی آئے گھوڑے پر سوار ہوتے ہیں عزداران حسین آپ جانتے ہیں کہ جہاں دریا ہوتا ہے پان پانی جو ہے نشیب کی طرف ہے اور وہاں چکے خیمے کے درخت تھے بلندی پہ جناب عباس اپنے گھوڑے پر آگے بڑھتے ہیں اب ایک ہی مقصد تھا عباس کا کہ حسین نے کہا تھا پانی کی کوئی سبیل کرو بچوں کے لیے بس یہ مشکیزہ خیموں تک پہنچ جائے جب خیموں جب خیمے جب خرمے کے درختوں کے درمیان سے گزرے ہیں ایک مرتبہ ایک ملعون پیچھے سے آتا ہے ہے اس طرح سے وار کرتا ہے کہ ایک بازو قلم ہو جاتا ہے عباس نے عالم مشکیزے کو دوسرے ہاتھ میں سبالا آگے بڑھتے ہیں لیکن دوسرا ملعون آگے بڑھا دوبارہ حملہ ہوا دوسرا بازو بھی قلب ہو جاتا ہے عباس نے مشکیزے کو اپنے دہن دانتوں میں دبا لیا اور اپنے پورے جسم کو گھوڑے کے گردن پر ڈال لیتے ہیں زور دیتے ہیں کہ گھوڑا آگے بڑھے تھوڑی دیر کے بعد عباس نے چاہا کہ دیکھے خیمے کتنی دور ہے عباسو تو نہیں تھے عباس نے اپنے پیروں سے رکاب کو زور دیا اپنے کو بلند کرتے ہیں کہ دیکھے خیمے کتنے دور ہے بس عباس کا بلند ہوں 
ढूंढा था एक तीर चला और आके मिश्की सी पर लगा ये 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 तीर सिर्फ मिश्की से पर न लगा अब्बास की उम्मीद खत्म हो गई अदौरान हुसैन हर बुज दिल सिपाही यजीदी लश्कर का करीब आता है और अपनी भड़ास निकालता है किसी ने तलवार से वार किया किसी ने नाजे से वार किया और आखिर में एक मलून आता है अपने गुर्ज को उठाया उसने और जनाब अब्बास के सर पर इस तरह से गुर्ज मारा कि अब्बास घोड़े पर न संभल सके रे हुसैन खुदा आपको सिवाय गम हुसैन किसी और गम में न रुलाए मैं चाहूँगा कि एक लम्हे के लिए हम करबला से मदीना जाएं इसलिए कि ये गुर्स की मुसीबत बहुत बड़ी मुसीबत थी जनाब मुलबनीन को जब खबर मिली वाकयात करबला के हालात बताए गए तो इस मुसीबत को सुन के अक्सर वो रोज आना जाती थी जन्नतुल बकी में बनु हाशिम की कब्रों के दरमियान एक मरसिया पड़ती थी जिसमें दो मिसरे यही थे कि बयान फरमाती है उम बी तो अन्नबनी उसी बबिरा सही मखतू यदीन क्या ये खबर लाने वाला ये सही खबर मिली है कि मेरे मेरे बेटे के सर पर गुर्ज उस वक्त लगा है जब उसके हाथ कट चुके थे फिर कहती हैं अब्बास अगर तेरे हाथ होते हाथ में तलवार होती ये गुर्ज तुम्हारे सर पर कोई न लगाता अब्बास घोड़े से जमीन पे आते हैं गिरने के बाद आवाज देते हैं या खाक अदर का खाक अरे भाई भाई की मदद को पहुंचे इमाम हुसैन सलाम ने उस वक्त वो मशहूर जुमला कहा है अलान इनका सरत जहरी व किल्लत ही मेरी कमर टूट गई मेरी तमाम तदाबीर खत्म हो चुकी अब्बास जाग के करीब पहुँचते हैं अदार हुसैन एक रवात में मिलता है एक जब इमाम बैठे हैं अब्बास के सर को अपने अपने जानू पर रखा है और खून को मिटा रहे थे पेशानी से उस वक्त मौला ने कहा अब्बास हम देख रहे हैं कि तुम रो रहे हो ये रोने की वजह क्या है एक अजीब जुमला कहा है वफा की इंतहा को आप देखें कहते हैं मौला मेरा सर आपके जानू पे है लेकिन कुछ मरहले के बाद आप जमीन पर होंगे लेकिन आपका सर किसी के जानू पे न हो इमाम ने आलम को उठाया और बैठते हैं खेमों की तरफ यहाँ सकीना ने बच्चों को जमा किया था कि मेरे चचा पानी लेके आ रहे हैं थोड़ी दूर में थोड़ी दूर से आलम नजर आया लेकिन जब करीब आता है आलम सकीना ने देखा आलम आया है लेकिन आलमदार नहीं आया बात है